So geospatial impact evaluations. This is something that here at A-Data we've been working on for quite a while now. Just as a bad, bit of background on A-Data, um, we are a research lab that's based at William & Mary, a university here in Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, just a few hours south of Washington, D.C., uh, one of the oldest universities uh, in, um, the, in North America, I should say. Uh, but we at uh, Will and Mary and, and A Data have uh, been around since about 2004. Um, we have a professional staff of about 35 folks, um, which is a mix of program evaluators and uh, policy analysts, uh, geospatial folks, et cetera. Um, our team that you're going to be interacting with uh, this week um, has particular expertise in GIS remote sensing. Um, causal inference. Um, and as you can see, we've partnered with lots of different folks over, uh, over the years. Uh, a big part of our focus at A-Data um, in uh, around 2008-9 and, and in the five or six years since then was really the launch of geo-referenced interventions. So identifying the locations of aid projects around the world. Um, uh, that began really with um, a, an effort to georeference the World Bank's portfolio, especially its IDA and IBRD projects. Um, often that meant drawing from annexes to the project appraisal documents, um, so, you know, really kind of searching through all the project documentation as, as best we could. And we've done a lot of this work together with a lot of undergraduate research assistants here who are helping us comb through all this material. But in the decade or so since then, we've geo-referenced uh, over a couple hundred thousand um, dead, uh, unique projects, um, which are now uh, geo-referenced to, to millions of actual locations um, worth over a trillion dollars. Some of this effort took a donor-specific uh, view. So the blue dots on the screen that you can see are this World Bank portfolio. We've now geo-referenced all um, uh, bank projects that were approved between 1995 and 2014. Um, and then some of this work took country specific views. So for example, the DRC, um, which you could see, we looked at all the different donors in the DRC and georeferenced all of those activities for a different, for a distinct time window um, using the aid information management system that's kept by each of those countries. So um, all of these different um, uh, georeferenced activities that we've now collected and compiled um, really made us then think, okay, what more can we do with all of this now that we have this, can create these great visualizations, can think about why certain areas are getting this, but why not others? And naturally, one of the things we linked that together with was newly available georeferenced outcome data on poverty, living conditions, the natural environment, um, agricultural outcomes. One of the most immediate things we linked it together with was things like nighttime lights and other remotely sensed outcomes, partly because these outcomes are now much more widely available, much more accessible and much cheaper to access um, altogether. Some of the earliest uses uh, where we applied this georeferenced aid activities together with georeferenced remote sensing and uh, survey-based activities was in evaluating infrastructure. So, um, and the images here, we're showing an example from Cambodia, where we evaluated a small-scale rural infrastructure project, um, uh, program uh, rolled out in combination with a variety of donors. Um, in this particular case, it was the Swedish um, EBA that funded this particular study. Sweden had been one of the key donors um, supporting this project. Um, and this was a community-driven development project. So at the top, you have um, the community members who are actively discussing which type of infrastructure they most want. Um, often, this was a rural road connecting the village um, to a nearby uh, secondary or, or main road. Um, and in other cases, it might have been small-scale irrigation. Um, and then in the bottom image, you see we've overlaid nighttime lights um, over the locations of these individual projects. Um, and in this particular case, we could trace out the growth of nighttime lights um, over time as these projects came online and, uh, and then matured. Um, and we could also uh, trace out 
the consequences for the natural environment, especially for deforestation. Another example is from the West Bank um, uh, in the Palestinian territories where uh, USAID had been funding a series of road improvements as well. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see these individual road segments um, that were funded. Again, over time, they were rolled out. Um, and uh, we drew buffers around those individual road segments. Obviously, you could see some of those buffers overlap because those road segments, some of, some of them are very close together um, and feed into similar um, main arterial routes. Um, our units of analysis in this particular case were individual nighttime lights grid cells. Um, this data that we used uh, had 750 meter square grid cells for them. Um, and then we analyzed that change in the nighttime lights output over a four year window when um, these roads were improved. Um, so that let us trace out again the causal inference, sorry, the causal improvement of, um, of the roads on the nighttime lights impacts as well. Moving beyond just infrastructure, though, um, we've also uh, done this in a number of other sectors. Um, this particular example we're looking at is from Brazil and the Brazilian Amazon, where indigenous communities had their land rights formally recognized by the Brazilian government with the support of the World Bank and German KFW. Um, in this particular case, German KFW sponsored this study that attempted to look at the long-term impacts of the formalization of these rights on forest conditions, especially deforestation. And uh, again, the di distinct communities had their rights formalized over different time periods. And so we could compare the changes um, over that time period using a panel design, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail tomorrow. Um, in this particular case, we saw no long-term impacts of these uh, community formalizations on um, the, sorry, the, the natural environment. Um, other studies since then have used other designs and detected smaller effects around the margins of the boundaries of some of these communities. We'll talk more about that tomorrow as well. Um, and then more recently, we've done work looking at uh, landmine clearance and um, its effects on development. Um, in this particular case, we complemented all of the nighttime lights and some of the other remote sensing measures with land use measures drawn from multispectral imagery. Um, Kunwar will tell you a lot more about that in just a little bit today, but um, this particular example is just meant to show that um, the changes in the amount of built up area, for example, around Kabul, um, over time that we could detect with the daytime multispectral imagery, and then link that together with the locations of the distinct um, landmine hazardous areas. Um, and their clearance um, in this uh, across Afghanistan, but in this particular snapshot around Kabul. Seth will talk to you in a little bit, a, a lot more about how we actually use that um, geospatial data about the particular interventions like the clearance of the landmines. So this is just meant to give you kind of a range of the different sectors and types of interventions that we're now studying with all of this. What does it actually take though to do a GIE? What do we think about as the kind of key components that distinguish a GIE from other designs? First of all, a very key ingredient, almost always the first thing that we focus on is the program data. We have to have well-specified geographic features. It's the intervention itself has to have kind of well understood geographic reach or extent. Um, and then that has to be captured in the GIS that um, it can be you know, well interpreted. We also often need details about the timing of the intervention by individual units. So as you've just seen in all these examples, we have the staggered rollout of these different interventions across space and across time. And often we're leveraging that staggered um, design for the causal inference piece. Um, so those are two very crucial components of the program data that we always need in a GIE. We then link that together with geo-referenced outcomes. 
Some of these outcomes, as you see, are remotely sensed from satellite imagery or other sort of sensors. Some of it are um, secondary data from things like the demographic and health surveys or living standards measurement surveys, um, or uh, primary data collection that is also georeferenced that you're commissioning or getting from another partner. Um, a series of key features, though, again, are um, very important to look at for all of these outcomes. So, you know, almost always we first focus on the spatial resolution and the spatial coverage of the data. Is it fine enough to look at the specific extent of effects that we expect from this particular program? Um, and how much coverage can it get us over um, a particular uh, geography? Also really important to think about the temporal resolution and coverage. Is it, um, is it uh, uh, recurring enough measurements that we can trace out the effects, again, over a, a fine enough time period? And how far back does this measurement go? Um, that's one of the first kind of constraints we often face. Lots of exciting new sensors and new data has come online in the last five or six years. Um, but of course, that means if you wanna go back further in time, you have to rely on some of the existing sensors, which definitely have some opportunities, but also some constraints. And then the last piece we have to integrate is our causal inference method and thinking about how we can leverage Often this, again, spatial and temporal variation of the rollout, maybe using some discontinuities, matching methods to account for remaining potential confounds, sometimes using all of these in combination. Some of the things we won't have as much time to talk about, but which we are excited about using more in the future are also things like synthetic control methods um, and kind of other designs that might be combined with some of these features. Putting all of this together can often get us a, a rigorous design, even when it's impractical or unethical or just not feasible to randomize. Um, partly because often we're using secondary data or data that's already been collected and available, this can be cheaper and faster to do than leveraging primary data collection, especially if you're doing that over a multi-year period. And partly as a result of the availability of this data, we can often do things retrospectively and remotely, all of which again contributes to the lower cost often of, of doing this. We, because we also often have larger scales to, with which to study this, again, much of this secondary data, whether it's remotely sensed or survey-based, is a pretty wide geographic scope. Um, and so that lets us better study geographic variation in the impacts to do real heterogeneity analysis um, and better understand how different parts of the country might be benefiting or not from a particular intervention. Different ethnic groups might be benefiting or not from a particular intervention. Just as with the geographic scope of this um, measurement can get us this heterogeneity analysis, we can also use often the long time scales that are available from this particular, you know, from these sources to look at longer run impacts than we often do in other evaluation designs. You know, sometimes the evaluations are just things we have to do at the end of the particular project funding. Um, but what we'd really like to do is to trace out five, eight, 10 years after the fact, are the effects persistent? Or in fact, did it take five years for the effects to really materialize to a scale that um, would be cost effective? Um, we can do a lot more of that with GIEs. They, again, part of what you've seen in the examples are cases where a particular donor funded a specific project and we're looking at the impacts of that particular project. In other cases, these are really portfolios where different donors have combined their efforts to mix the um, uh, funding into a, a country scale effort. Certainly the case in that Afghanistan landmine clearance uh, or the Brazilian um, indigenous land rights formalization. And so this lets us scale up also the studies to being portfolio level studies and really, I think, much more powerful and representative in that sense. And um, just want to emphasize, and I don't think I can emphasize this enough, although we'll be talking a lot about quasi experimental designs and remotely sensed data. All of this can be paired together with qualitative work on the ground and even RCT designs, all of which I think is super complementary and makes all of this 
um, all of those individual tools much more powerful when, when combined. Certainly lots of things we can't answer from space um, and lots of things we can't answer with a quasi-experimental design, um, you know, all of which I think is, is more powerful when we do this in combination.